So thank you everyone for coming. I'm Emily. I'm one of your friendly local librarians here in the <coughs> Southwest region. Um, welcome to the Southwest branch. You all probably know it better than me. Um, we are delighted to have this monthly series with the Southwest Historical Society, Words Writers, and West Seattle. Um, and it's, uh, I'm going to hand it over in just a sec to Dora Faye Hendricks, who coordinates this whole series. We do have a little survey at the end that hopefully you'll fill out to help us understand what this program means to you um, and just a little bit about you. And with that, we're delighted to have the program and also Claudia. Thank you very much, Emily. Yeah. We're delighted to be here too. We're delighted for the co-sponsorship that the library <coughs> provides us, the same place every time, and friendly people who help with the equipment and this very nice room. Um, I've been um, in West CL for only six years, something like that. And as quick as I came here, I saw an ad in the paper asking for volunteers. The Historical <laughs> Society is still looking for volunteers, so if any of you would like to um, come on, <laughs> and see what we're about, see what kind of jobs are available. I didn't know. I went to the training, and I've never been into museums before, but these were interesting people. So I have learned a lot about Seattle and West Seattle. I come from the Spokane area. We're inlanders. This has been cool. And it was <laughs> shortly after I started that the director then, Clay Eels, asked me, told me about this idea that our video uh, a vi videographer, is that what you call him? Judy Bentley uh, was um, <laughs> yeah. instrumental in putting together. So the, the idea was not mine, but I got started right away. She gave me some suggestions of local authors that I could contact. We've been doing this for more than, we're on our sixth year now, every wow. month. And I'm, very proud of that. and I'm proud of um, the connections we have, and I met an extra one tonight that maybe could help us find other authors. We have another author in our midst. Um, Arlene Williams has presented three times. Uh -huh. She's a prolific writer. And uh, Claudia, did you know there's another Claudia Rowe? Yes. And presented to us. And I'm looking in my address book and I go, whoa, wait a minute, which is which? And make sure my emails are separate from you. <laughs> so you become Claudia Luna in my address. Okay. Which, yeah, okay. And she's Claudia Rowe. But anyway, we are very um, honored to have Claudia Castro Luna with us tonight. And how many of you have not heard of her before? Ah, very nice. So we have a, a ways to go to get acquainted. Yeah. But I wanted to tell you I appreciate you giving me the extra information um, that you provided to me online. And I there's a lot of information from the Humanities um, Washington and the Washington State Arts Commission about Claudia and what they do and I'm going to mention a little bit because it was interesting information that I pulled for her um, introduction tonight. So I will just let you go with that <coughs> later and we will have questions and answers. Yes. All right, great. Maybe they'll have a lot. I've been intrigued. I'm not into poetry mm -hmm. uh, in general. But I've really been intrigued by your story and your history and what you are doing. So I'm anxious to sit down and enjoy it too. Yeah. Humanities Washington and the Washington State Arts Commission, known as Arts WA, <laughs> we're excited to announce that Claudia Castro Luna, a prominent Seattle poet and teacher, was appointed as the fifth Washington State Poet Laureate by Governor Jay Inslee. This was in 17, is that right? It was, no, it was February of last year. February, okay. Mm -hmm. I, oh, 2018. 2018. Yes, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, the Washington State Poet Laureate Program is jointly sponsored by Humanities Washington and Arts WA. Poets Laureate work is to build awareness and appreciation of poetry, including the state's legacy of poetry, through public readings, workshops, lectures, and presentations in communities throughout the state. So this is one of them, right? Mm -hmm. As the first immigrant and woman of color to assume the role, Claudia will be advocating for poetry during a particularly difficult period for both the humanities and immigrant populations who are confronting uncertainty in the face of travel bans and heated rhetoric. 
This is so misquoted. This is so much more than an honorary position, said Julie Ziegler, Executive Director of Humanities Washington. It's very <coughs> hard work, particularly in an era when our country is profoundly divided. The poet laureate gives a lot of herself, or his self, <laughs> traveling thousands of miles back and forth across the state to reach the widest range of people possible. Born in El Salvador, Claudia fled war-torn El Salvador for the United States at the age of 14 with her family and went on to earn an MFA in poetry and an MA in urban planning. After working as a K-12 teacher, she became Seattle's first civic poet, a position appointed by the mayor. In that position, Castro Luna won acclaim for her Seattle Poetic Grid an online interactive map of showcasing poems about different locations around the city. The grid even landed her an interview on PBS NewsHour. She is also the um, author of the poetry chat book, The City, and the collection, Killing Marias. While fleeing El Salvador with her parents and sister in 1981, <coughs> Claudia's father insisted on bringing a cumbersome box of books including works on mathematics, social science, and language. Her rediscovery of the box in her attic years, uh, in her attic years later prompted her to write a short story for Humanities Washington's Bedtime Stories event in 2015 about the importance of literature informing identity, much of which will be included in a memoir she is writing on her escape from the Salvadorian Civil War entitled, Like Water to Drink. That's coming up this year or next year? Probably next year, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Claudia's poems have appeared in Poetry Northwest. How do you pronounce La... La Bloga. La Bloga. Um, <laughs> Dialogo. Dialogo. <laughs> Thank you. And Psychological Perspectives. I know that one. Among <laughs> others. Her nonfiction work <laughs> can be read in several anthologies. Among them, This is the Place, colon, women working, writing, women writing about home. Since 2009, Claudia maintains a blog with reflections, writing, and reviews. Living in English and Spanish, she writes and teaches in West Seattle where she gardens and keeps chickens with her husband and their three children. Please help me welcome Claudia to Words Writer. <laughs> It is such a pleasure to be here because this is my local library. I live a few blocks up the street, so my kids have grown up coming to this library, to this particular branch, and, uh, and I am starting. I did a reading yesterday at CMP Coffee and one today, and I feel really blessed to begin the year in my local, in my local community. And in both of those instances, I have to say, um, Leopoldo Siegel uh, curates the CMP uh, reading series. And to you for putting all the work that goes together in, you know, it's a lot of work to organize these moments for all of us and to come together in community and in peace. <coughs> I'm always amazed at the power of literature and poetry to bring people together in I think in peace and beauty, because that's what we're here. We're here to listen, to to relish words, really, and to and to have a moment of that. It's very rare. I think it becomes more and more difficult to have moments of, of communion like this. So thank you for all that work. <coughs> um, so I travel the state uh, doing poetry readings. It's part of the job. My predecessors have done it as well. I closed the year in Lewis County. Um, that was the largest travel that's on the other side of Mount Rainier. So I was there for a week and visited lots of small communities there. And I'm opening the year here. Um, in between that, in December, my father, I'm from El Salvador, as you noted, and my father still lives there and he became quite ill. So um, I actually had to cancel an event in Burlington, which I haven't done because I needed to travel in emergency to El Salvador to be with my dad. Um, so it was quite a, a, a difficult time. And in preparation for the reading today, I, so part of what happened with my travel, to El, my unexpected travel, 
is that I wrote some new poems and was able to rethink this book, <coughs> this prose book, and put some of those thoughts into poems, which for a long time I had not been able to do. So something positive came, aside from the fact that my father will recover uh, from the stroke that he suffered, something positive also came out of that trip. So today I wanted to read, it's mostly new work, um, and sort of weave together poems about El Salvador and tell a little bit about that story, because, um, you know, just to vary it up, I guess. But I always, in every reading I, I do, I begin by sharing a poem written by a child in Washington State. And, you know, I teach classes in schools, kids, teachers send me poems, I collect poems, and um, this is from this anthology put together every year by Seattle Arts and Lectures from their Writers in the Schools program. And um, let me just let me read a different poem than I have. You know, you have to change things. Okay, here it is. Okay, so um, this is a really beautiful book. It comes out every year. Um, this one is called Tomorrow I Will Whisper Your Name, and it's an anthology of writing from children in high school, every from kindergartners all the way to seniors in high school. And it's really tremendous. And so this one is written by an Evergreen High School ninth grader whose name is Yareli Lopez Martinez. It's a very short poem. She wrote it in Spanish first, and then it is translated in English, and I'll read both. Um, so, mi carga. Algunas memorias nunca se van de tus huesos. Como la sal del mar se convierte parte de ti y lo cargas. My load, some memories never leave your bones. Like the salt in the sea, they become part of you, and you carry them. Yeah, it's really wonderful. <laughs> it's really amazing. Kids do amazing work. Uh, so before, so I brought, I, like I said, this is new. New year, new reading. Um, so, but I did want to share with you, normally I read poems from this, but these two books are my books which exist in the system, in the public library system. I've run out of books, so I apologize for not having any, it's sometimes handy to have books. Uh, but I don't, I don't have any, but I know that the library, you could actually board. We have two issues here, right? And this one as well, the 129, yeah. And they, our library system has several copies of them, so you can borrow them from the library. And Elio Bay Books uh, has some, and Open Books as well, the poetry bookstore. Um, so I want to start, I put together a little, um, a little PowerPoint. I want to start with a poem I wrote the last, so this, this uh, I was in El Salvador just in December, before that I had been in El Salvador two years prior. And the two years prior, I went thanks to a King County uh, for Culture grant for writing this book that you mentioned, this memoir. Um, I asked for a grant to travel as a research grant because a lot of my memories I carry with me, as that poem says, but as writers we need immediate data. So I wanted to go back to El Salvador and hear it again and taste the food and meet my relatives again, and just be there in order to take notes. So I went to take field notes. And to tell you the truth, um, I was a 14-year-old when the Civil War happened, when my family left, so I have a lot of trauma around the war. And so I have been in El Salvador at this point four times in 36 years. Mm -hmm. And not because I don't want to go, but because it's so overwhelming, the thought of traveling down there that I actually actively have avoided going because I'm so afraid. I'm afraid of a country that, of the country I left. The country has moved on. People, you know, things have happened there, but I'm somehow still think that it is the way it was when I left, which is a terrible war that we were in the middle of. So I, I wrote this grant and my friend said, they'll never give it to you. They don't do those type of grants. And I thought, well, if I get the grant, I'll have to go. And if I don't get it, I don't go. So I was, you know, I was going to be okay if I didn't get the grant. It was, but lo and behold, I did get it. And I waited months and months and months to get the nerve out to actually go there. 
and finally I knew I needed to do it. So I went. I booked a, and it was a very interesting trip because it gave me a purpose. I was there with an intention to visit specific places, to take notes, and that was very refreshing for me because it freed me from the uh, tentacles of these memories of war that I had. So this poem that I'll read to you comes from, um, comes from that trip. Oh, let's see. Hmm. Emily, I heard it yes. click. Did it go on? Yes, there oh, it is. Okay. Thank you. But yeah, and uh, oh, there we go. So I titled this My El Salvador. And I want to say that I ended up, so this is a little bit about poetry and how poetry comes about, because one of the, my firm beliefs is that we are all poets. We could sit down right now and work on writing a poem, and I guarantee you we would walk out of the room having written something that is deeply truthful to ourselves, which is what poetry is. And so the Pollinator Society of Seattle, we have such a thing in <laughs> Seattle, asked me to open up their annual conference with a poem. And I thought, this was last summer, and I thought, oh, I've been park steward, I've been, I've done things to motivate, uh, you know, to plant native plants, to, um, to get pollinators to come to gardens. I could write a poem about bees. And so I, I accepted this, and I thought, yeah, I could write a poem, because this is part of what being in these positions as a public poet is about. Somebody could call you and say, we're opening a um, hospital. Would you write a poem to dedicate this? I write two poems for parks, for instance. A park is being remodeled, and it's going to be rededicated. Would you write a poem for that? And so this was kind of like that. It was a poem to order. I thought I could write a poem about bees, no problem. So I sat down to write a poem about bees, and something completely unexpected came out of that poem, which is this poem called Ask the Bees. So, and that is El Salvador, unlike, unlike, West, unlike the Northwest, which has trees that grow up and down in a vertical way. These trees grow outward, and so they are these enormous, gorgeous canopies that extend out because it's very hot there, and they give the most glorious shade. So that is um, looking up at a tree with some banners at a, at a festival. So ask the bees. On my last trip to El Salvador, spiraling down a remote mountain highway, I spotted a woman and her child sitting on the side of the road. A sun-bleached umbrella cast shade on her and on a table stacked with unlabeled glass vessels filled with honey. Behind her, a steep gorge, ravishing emerald wound, hummed a tune that told of the beginning of things. The honey came from there, she said, pointing at the jungle below. Mystery of forest, mystery of honey, necessity of survival, this mother making a living from the industriousness of ear soot insect fairies harvesting nectar and iridescent powder from wild flowers, making beauty edible. Her honey emanated a neon glow, bright and potent, as if alive. The pulsating force of the gorge, the song of the torobos, the roar of the jaguar, the gloss of the leaves, the soil, volcanic ash, hung suspended inside each container. For us to remember this brilliant day, I said to Papa, handing him a jar, on this day when we stood arm in arm and talked about the war, what it took from all of us, a day when I asked him to name every tree, every flower we came across, and he did. He named them all. A gesture that said we are from here, from this forsaken place where we know the names of things. On my return at Dallas airport, a customs officer confiscated my jar. Mm -hmm. Later, in a cafe waiting for my flight to Seattle, I felt my cheeks wet, my tears like a meandering rivulet through the lush terrain that sustained the bees that made the honey that helped the woman help herself. In the airport's sterile setting, I considered the honey of things. How much time would have to pass before I'd walk alongside my papa once more? How is it that we overlook what is important, value the wrong things? 
what would they say about the meaning of grief if I asked them? The bees who turn sun's fire into an edible gem. Magicians and scientists at once, they have for millennia healed us, nourished us, pollinated this blue sphere we call home. Those ancient alchemists hunting for the truth and power to transmute base metals into gold searched in vain. Bees have known the secret all alone, transforming with exquisite care, which is also love, yellow dust into liquid gold. So that became my It was completely unexpected for me that I would write about the war when I really intended to write about the bees. But this is when I sat down to write these two events. I think partly because they took away that honey at the airport mm -hmm. and it was so Oh, it was so full of meaning for me, and it looked really delicious. And I begged the person who took it away for him to keep it. I said, keep it. Don't throw it away. You know, you eat it if you don't want me to bring it into the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and he said no, and he threw it into a bin right in front of me. So that was very painful, and I don't think I ever really processed that until I sat down to write this poem about bees, and then that that story came through. Yes, yes. So I wanted to read a very short poem from this book, which is completely tattered because I carried it everywhere. And it's marked, so it has all my marks for it. This one is again about the role of memory in our everyday lives. And for those of us who have moved from another place, like you carry around Spokane in your heart, right in a way, you're standing there and you could call Spokane in your mind's eye and we don't know what it is because you know it, but we don't, right? But we, I think that's magical that we could all sit here and have these places in our hearts and minds and they're completely inside us. Memories, maps, locations, um, and they're real. They're really real to us. I, I think I find that fascinating. And yet here we are in West Seattle and we could step out and. Do you know what I mean? I think that's just an amazing thing. So this one is called Farmer's Market. And I go to the West Seattle Farmer's Market, which over the years has grown and grown and grown. <laughs> I liked it when it was in that parking lot back there. <laughs> now it takes over the street. Anyhow, I'm a huge fan of Farmer's markets, And I always thought it was because I, I like supporting local agriculture, eating local, all that, but I, understood in writing this poem that I like them for something else as well. And welcome, there's chairs up here. Thank you. Yeah. So this poem sort of gets at that too. Farmer's Market. I go early to hear the citrus tales of pomelos and satsumas in May, discuss the snap with favas. I'm oh, sorry, let me start again. Farmer's Market. I go early to hear the citrus tales of pomelos and satsumas in January. Discuss the snap with favas in May. Have a word with a merchant without saying anything. Hold a coin bag in one hand and with the other chat with an unsuspecting tomato. <laughs> Market speak is the language of being a girl walking with my mother down narrow lanes in the mercado, sweat streaming brow, dogs impatient weaving between legs, stealthy robbers articulating sneaks, sellers shouting incantations to buy this cure-all remedy and for a bargain, una mano, all the fruit that can fit in the palm of your hand. At every turn, my local farmer's market betrays the one I long for. The mercado I search lives dormant, a tiny seed rhyming festive and mom inside my heart. So I realize you know, I like farmer's markets because they reproduce the markets of my childhood. And now that I was in El Salvador, I made sure to go back to the markets. and. When I was a kid in El Salvador, there were no supermarkets as we know them here with the bright neon lights. Now, of course, there are places like that. But when I was little, everything happened in the local market, which is a building, but lots of people spill out onto the streets selling their amazing produce. And, and I think the farmer's market uh, gives me an opportunity to be in touch with that memory, even if it's unconscious, which most of the time I think actually it is. So this next poem, 
Yes, this next poem is <coughs> called Noble Call, and that is a woman making tortillas. Our tortillas in El Salvador are different than the tortillas in Mexico. They're a lot thicker um, and not as big. So they're smaller discs and very thick, as you can see there. And um, <coughs> that is a, a clay, we call it comal. So the tortillas get cooked not on metal, but on clay. And that also infuses them with a particular you know, smell and scent. And that gets very cured, those, those um, tacomales. So the, the tray there, the clay pot, is cures over time. And they taste delicious just like that, right mm -hmm. hot off the griddle like that. So this, um, so this I wrote, this is a brand new poem, and I always say, especially to students, that it's important to share brand new work uh, as a way of measuring oneself and as a way of showing for me, for the kids, that poems are works in progress, right? That we continually edit things, that it just doesn't happen overnight when we write something, and that sometimes reading a poem, for me, out loud, I hear back to myself and think, oh, that's not working so well. And um, so I do it as a way of showing the craft of writing. Um, and also just for me, I think, I think it's good. I think it's good practice. So this is brand new. Um, what did I want to say about this? This poem ends with an expression in Spanish called bueno di Buenos Dias Le De Dios, which means may God grant you a good day. And when I was a little girl, my grandmother, everybody said this to each other in the morning as a greeting, buenos dias, le de Dios. So I thought it was one word. <laughs> I never thought it was five words, you know, because people say it so quickly. Then it took me a long time. I was actually an adult, I think, when I realized, oh my God, that's like a whole bunch of words. So, but this poem will end with that line. And it also talks about this uh, little child saint in my my entire, my father's family all lives on the same, lives in the same town, in the same street to this day after generations of people living there. In a very small rural town, and you will see a photo of it later, um, on the very edge of the Guatemalan and Salvadoran border. So there is about seven kilometers <coughs> for what to get to one of the borders to cross into Guatemala, also rural Guatemala, but it's very, very close. And there's volcanoes on the Guatemalan side, and they are right there. They look like you could walk to them, and you probably can. You know, they're so close. So I grew up in this in a valley with Guatemala on one side and with a, a mountain range on the other on the Salvadoran side. So very blue there. It's very blue. Um, and this is called Noble Call. Roosters, oh, so what I wanted to tell you, in this little neighborhood where my father lives, there's an ancient little figurine that is of, a, of the child, of Jesus, of a, of a child saint, and it's said to dispense miracles. And every Christmas day, there's a huge festivity that happens on the street. Um, the saint has been in the same family also for generations. Apparently, some people came through town, and they didn't have a place to stay. This family offered them a place to stay, and they said, thank you. And in exchange, we leave you with this figurine, and um, you know, if you could honor it, please. And, and they have. This family throws a party every year. They dress him in this beautiful clothing. <coughs> and I had heard so much about it, but never had seen it. And this December, because it was December, and Christmas was arriving, and it was all these festivities, I asked one of my cousins, they couldn't believe I'd never seen it. So they took me to the family. We knocked on the door. Somebody put their head out, and he explained that his cousin had never seen the child. And so they allowed us in, because that's what they do there. That's kind of their charge. So they let us go in, and they brought this figure. And it was, it was really um, astounding the, how beautiful this, this figure is. It's a wooden, a wooden rendition of baby Jesus. Mm -hmm. and. It, it was striking. I could see how it would, people would think that it rendered, it gives, you know, miracles. And my kids said to me back here in West Ham, did you take a photograph? Where is it? And I said, you know, sometimes you can't take photographs. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to just look and be there and remember. And it felt appropriate for me at the moment not to photograph it, but it was really, it's really a beautiful, very old, 
you can tell that it's very old. Um, little baby. Noble call. Roosters crow here no matter noon or dawn, call and response back and forth across yards. Sometimes a dog answers, then another. A gust of wind rubs leaves into waxy applause. This is the sound of happiness. The bicyclist announcing fresh bread making his way up the road with a quick and insistent sound from the horn with a red rubble rubber ball mounted on the handlebars. He navigating puddles and swerving stones on uneven streets with a crater-sized wicker basket attached to the front of his old bicycle. Layer upon layer of crispy rolls, oven heat nestled yet in their fluffy white hearts. This is the sound of nothing rushed, of conversation struck up easy just because of an ancient wooden figure for generations held by the same family dispensing miracles year round. El Niño Chiquito, resplendent in satin and taffeta, gold thread and lace. His dress, a textile shrine stitched by local women, their hands swollen from washing clothes, from washing corn with lime, from grinding grain into masa, what will be tortillas by noon. In and out of needle, women sewing life, the coming and going between. We love you, they tell the virgin. We love you, they tell her son. We love you, they don't tell each other. They don't tell each other. Instead, they mean when they say, buenos dias, le de Dios. Mm -hmm. My father lived here, you know, we came to the U.S., my entire family, my, my mom and my dad, my sister and myself, and my father went back. My father was never at home here in the U.S. They were both teachers, so he went back to El Salvador and went back into teaching and then retired. And when I went to see him the first time, I was amazed at the, at the garden he had created. People are huge gardeners. But Gardening happens there in a different way. A lot of it is fruit gardening. So these are the trees in my in my aunt's house from, you know, I was sitting down and I took a photograph. Look at that sky. This is December. <laughs> Incredible. Um, and um, everything is huge there because it's the tropics and it rains and it's hot and so the leaves are enormous. The flowers are enormous. You know, everything has the possibility of Weeds just grow huge and lots of them, right? I mean, it's not sparse vegetation. And gardens are a lot, that is an orange tree that you see there. So gardens are marked by trees rather than lower growing bushes as we, as we have here. And so I was astounded at my dad's garden, when I, the lushness of it. And this is one of the, um, this is perhaps the first poem I ever read in public. And I tell students the first time I ever read a poem in public was at a college, and the professor asked me to read it, and I was terrified. And I got up on stage, and I don't think I was done with the last word. I was already off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> so my father's garden. My father's garden bears no resemblance to the orderly paradises found in glossy magazines. There are no tidy borders to admire, no coordinating color palettes. Here, the eye is overtaken by a mass of unapologetic green, olive green, forest green, lemon green, green green, and speckled among the verdure, calling attention to the resplendent selves are flowers in many hues and shapes. The mallows, my father's favorites, offer blooms as big as birds' nests. Petals glisten in midday sun, stretch wide and far. There is little modesty in their display. There is no coyness in this garden, only abundance and overflow. Zinnias grow by the dozen, roses burst yellow, salmon, red, bougainvilleas, trumpet flowers, a pulsing profusion planted all with trembling hands. Twenty years in exile is a long time to contemplate each leaf a coming to terms with lost ideals, each flower a testament to fallen friends, each new seedling a last salute to persecutions of the heart. My father's garden is a nascent Eden, 
a rooting back to his native land. I'll read this poem. This this is about Seattle now. And this is about Kubota Gardens. Have you guys been there? Yeah, it's such a beautiful place. Uh, if you haven't been, it's a local garden. It's a Seattle garden out in, um, what is that? It's off of Rainier. You know Rainier Rented. Street? Rancho yeah. Avenue. Rancho Avenue. So, yeah, it's not far from here. And it's really a work of art. And what I've learned about Kubota Garden is that it was owned, it was developed really by a Japanese immigrant who was a gardener himself, and that was his demonstration garden. So he would take people and say, this is what I could do to your house. And he is an, was an incredibly gifted person. And when the Japanese were interned, he was interned as well. So he left that garden, which was a couple of acres already, and he was creating a different, a Japanese aesthetic here that was really new. Uh, using rocks and um, water elements to to include in a garden, which was really kind of, it was new here. So he was a pioneer of, of garden design. And so he was in turn and left his garden, which was several acres. He, of course, had to leave everything. And while he was in the internment camp, I think in Idaho, he gardened there, too. And when he came back, it was in absolute disrepair. The garden, he actually had to buy it back because he had been taken from him and he had to buy it back. And he bought it back and, <clears throat> and continued working on it, actually uh, uh, bought more land. And the amazing thing to me is that when he died, he donated this garden to the city of Seattle. Mm -hmm. And I think that, what a, what a civic gesture. You know, I mean, that to me is <clears throat> profound, that somebody would be treated that way Right, and that he would then come back and donate a labor of love and also money because it's a lot of land, it's acres and acres of land for public use. And his kids have continued the legacy, and it's just an outstanding, beautiful place. So I'll read this and then another short poem. This is also new, it's called Terra Firma. We walked mother daughter through Iron Gate into Verdant Room, sensing all paths were equally right. We would not see each other for a while, wanted to spend time together, do things mothers and daughters do. We climbed flank of mountain, forest landscape embracing us early morning. And with each skyward step, whatever easy words we had been speaking fell from us, like ripened leaves break off their branches. But to tell the truth, words had long before fallen from our trees. From the mountain top, 35 years of exile spread below us, decades of struggling alone with our hearts of darkness, war years never spoken of, the grind of life at the margins, keeping fears inside so as not to worry the other. We were warriors, each of us, though we did not know it. The silence we came to understand as normal corroded the wood of us, wounded us to ourselves and to each other. The morning wore on leaf upon leaf, bark on bark. Side by side, sitting on a bench, we ate our picnic lunch. I chewed and listened to the waterfall nearby. Sorry. I chewed and listened to the waterfall nearby. The silence of my mother is the silence of her own mother, and my silence is that of all the mothers and grandmothers before us, it said. Generations of women who learn to do rather than speak to survive. What patient gardeners each of my female ancestors must have been pruning and clipping away parts of themselves to let their young ones grow tall, become trees. Maple against spruce, ginkgo against cedar, emerald lawns, mossy moss, celluloid harmony plus friendly carp on spring-fed pond. Conspiracy of garden revealing my mother's quiet inner partiture. Words fail, they often do, but on this day of leaf bark stone, what was left unsaid spun terra firma, gurgle and froth of waterfall song told me so. So I'll leave it there because I. I want to answer some questions, and I often find that in, in the question and answer 
time of a presentation is really when interesting things happen. And if I find that I could answer your question with a poem, I'll do that. <laughs> but you know, people, a lot of times people don't know what a poet laureate does or what, what do you do when you have that. So I'm happy to answer questions about that aspect of you know, my life right now and also about being an immigrant in the US or about being a writer in the world. Any, any of those questions I'm happy to, to answer. Yeah. I'm trying to remember if you said this in the beginning. When did you start writing poetry? Oh, um, well, formally, I started writing poetry in college as a college student, but I never showed those poems to anybody. But it was very much a, you know, something I was drawn to doing. Um, I didn't start formally writing until I was already, I was, I was expecting my third child. I have three kids. And I had decided to take a community college class because I felt such a calling. I knew I had to go do this thing. And I took a community college class and loved it. It was a creative writing class. And then I took another one and another one. And it just was not enough, these community college classes. At, at one point, I understood that I needed to do, to do this full time. And then gave up my job, which at the time was coaching new teachers. Uh, so I was a, a master teacher, if you will, and went and, and did an MFA, a full-time MFA program. And that was maybe 12 years ago. Um, so then I really, that, that is what I did. And I actually think, I have a poem that explains that. I can read it. <laughs> um, because a lot of time, I, I, I thought about it as a dog. I thought of poetry as a dog. Kind of like a little dog that wouldn't leave me alone. Um, you know, a, a dog that insisted and, and bit me, and I would write letters and they would turn into poems. Or I would start writing something and I would get line breaks in my, in my page, you know, which wasn't welcome. It wasn't what I was going for, you know. And suddenly there it was. And I was explaining this to a, a teacher, a, a Greg Orr, actually. I took a class with him in Canada. And he said, you need to go write that story. And she said, show up tomorrow with that poem. Go write it. And I thought, why did I ever open it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I got an assignment. But I did. I went back and I wrote this experience of what poetry has been like for me because I truly don't feel that I chose to do it. You know, I feel that I was, I was asked to do it. I was sort of beaten into wanting to do it like this little dog, you know? So this is called As Such to be Chosen. She had always been there, trailing me with scent of musk and torn book. Take me in, she said one day with a bark, once command and twice seductive plea. I felt her rough coat, every inch of her wild, her fluorescent eyes given away nothing, the fierceness of her canine teeth, Panic swept me, and I leapt best to hug familiar territory, the way a toddler holds on to her mother's skirt. But she followed me up one year, down the next, nipping my ankles, sleeping at my feet, splicing my dreams with our untamed lease. She stayed on until I let her in. I let this dog that walked away from wolf enter me whole, fur, tail, jaw. She'd long known that I belonged to it, not the other way around. Poetry nuzzled me away from self-pity. Be animal, she said, and return me to the wilderness inside myself, where flowers are words that hang from trees, tortillas are halos, and over moist ground, lyrics grow scattered and unattached. Mm -hmm. oh. mm -hmm. That's great. that, you know, at one point when I started really taking poetry seriously and really devoting myself to it, the dog never showed up again. It really <laughs> yeah. And somebody in one reading said to me, I think you became the dog. <laughs> Maybe you're right. Maybe I did. I'll take that. <laughs> yeah. So, I noticed some of your poems are, you know, they're often about gardens and food and mm. things like that. And, uh, uh, you were also introduced that I noticed that you own chickens. Yeah. Did you ever write a poem about your chickens? No. Why not? I, I know. <laughs> you know I, I was looking at them yesterday because it was a rainy day and we have a wheelbarrow in the coop 
we have a run for them, and they were just so quiet. Three, like we have five, and three of them were underneath, just so quietly there, just looking at the rain. And I thought it sounds like you're writing a poem now. I, <laughs> I know, and I thought those chickens have something to tell me about presence <coughs> and being, and just just being with life. You know, they were they were just patiently there, and I thought I gotta write a poem about this about my chickens because they were teaching me a lesson. But yeah, no, I, I haven't yet. Yeah. I have a friend in Bolivia. He's a business partner, and I talk to him almost every day. And he's having someone special come over for dinner. I said, what are you having? He said, we're having a chicken. We got it from the neighbor. It was making too much noise. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. 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 I, don't, I will not. My, my hands have stopped laying eggs. Uh, We've had them for so long. They don't, they're no longer. I mean, we're just, they're pets now. <laughs> and, and so we could not, my kids would not go. Oh, he actually said rooster, not chicken. Oh, uh, having a rooster. Oh, yeah. Rooster. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, so first, we'll oh, behind okay. you, and then, yeah. How is it decided where you go in the state? Do you get, like, all the counties sequentially? Yeah, or? different poets have done different things. I, I think um, Elizabeth Austin uh, set out to travel to every single county in the state, and she did that. That was her goal. Uh, Todd Marshall, who came before me, traveled an enormous, and he's from Spokane, mm -hmm. and he covered huge areas of the state. I'm thinking more of, well, I tell you, one of my, uh, my projects, so this book is Todd Marshall's culminating project as, as Poet Laureate, uh, this book 129, and uh, it has poems from all over the state, people writing, not necessarily about Washington, but Washingtonians writing poetry. And um, my, when I was a civic poet of Seattle, I made a digital project, a digital map that I call Seattle Poetic Grid, which exists online. And it's a, essentially a digital book. Um, so when you go to this website, you get a map of Seattle. It's a very clean map with little blue dots on it. And when you click on the dots, they open up to a poem and a photograph of that very place where the dot is placed. And the idea there, those, those are all poems written by people across the city. Some in this very room, because I did workshops in different libraries across the city, and I collected cult poems because I wanted Seattle explained in the voices of, of ourselves, citizens in Seattle. So if you go to that map, you, you get to read really extraordinary poems. I mean, they're really amazing. And um, the poem that was so successful, as you read, that I, the PBS NewsHour came out here and did a segment on that, that <coughs> I want to do a digital map for the state. And so I feel that that will be my contribution to the entire state, to places where I cannot go. Because I have a family, it's harder for me to travel. Um, and, but what I'm doing is I'm spending, I'm trying to, I'm trying to go somewhere and spend time there as a way of getting to know community. So I was in um, Mineral, which is in Lewis County. I was in Okanagan County. So that's Twist and Okanagan, that kind of central, more central part. And just like I'll go for a week and then I get to really be there and I visit high schools and schools and do readings and workshops, and that's kind of my way of, of being in communion with that place. I don't think I'll uh, get every county necessarily, but I hope that the map then will become a living legacy because we will continue to add poems. And the poems are about poems of place, you know? So when I was doing the grid, I got this guy, um, Green Lake, who sent me a poem, because then I, have, I did an open call, and he had a poem about skating in New York City. And it was lovely, but the po and he lives in Seattle, but I wanted the poems to be about Seattle. I wanted the poems to be about Green Lake, not, do you know what I mean? So I want these poems in place. And I will start working on that. Um, hopefully by the end of the month, there'll be a, a general uh, a, a map up that people could see, and then have an open call for poems to start coming in. Yeah. Yes, you have your hand up. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, so you said that uh, you went to college for poetry, and I want to see how that affected your style, or like did it give you structure 
uh, because that's one thing I'm worried about. The reason why I went into poetry yeah. is for the sense of freedom and the means to express. Yes. And if I uh, keep a structure on it, I would lose that you know original feeling, yeah. that sense of uh, expression. Yeah. Uh, I, I came from a field of engineering where all my life I was told be logical. Yeah. Be with your mind, never with yeah. your heart. Yes. Uh, just, uh, be a soldier, never express. It. Yeah. So when my father died, uh, it was you know. Uh, I kept seeing like ideas of abstraction that I wanted to express. Yeah. But since I can't paint, I went into poetry. Yes. And uh, now I'm thinking about you know maybe just going to school, but I'm afraid you know how does it shape the way you express? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. What I want. Yeah. I you know I think for me it was necessary for me to go because I was then absolutely immersed in it, and I became a scholar of poetry. Right. So then. I think there is a part of it that is a spontaneous expression, and there is a part of it that is work too. That is learning to sit down and and make and write, and that structure came from being in in a program where I was I taught myself to sit down and write poems, even when it wasn't coming to me. Just learning to sit down and and how do you then harness this energy and these thoughts that we have. That came from the discipline of being in, a, in an MFA program. And also sort of understanding what's possible. Um, because we have a way of expressing ourselves, right? Each of us would write our poetry. But then how does that fit into the larger conversation of, of poetry in general? And how do what other people are doing could teach me something about how to say what I want to say? Do you know what I mean? So for me, it was very fruitful. Um, I understand that it doesn't have, it, it's not that way for people, for everyone, but for me it was, um, it was very fruitful to be in a setting where there was learning about it and application. Uh, because I knew that uh, that's where I was going. There was no turning <coughs> back for me. Once I went to school, there was no turning back. And so I, I wanted to learn as much as possible. And in my MFA program, there was a, a, a guy who was also an engineer, and he went to do an MFA program because he, just like you, um, and it was very interesting being with him because the way in which he thought about just thinking, you know, um, showed itself on, on the way in which he organized the poems, and he's still writing. So, yes, so I think that, that was very interesting for us, for the rest of us who came from not a science or mathematics background to have him in class because he offered very interesting perspectives. Yeah, so I hope it's fruitful for you if you decide to do it. Yeah, yeah. Which makes me wonder, um, as part of your role, are you doing any writing workshops? Oh yeah, yes. And where I, does one see the um, dates and times? And yeah, the, like? the, the <coughs> schedule for that is always in the Washington State Poet Laureate um, events. Uh, page. So I wanted to say tomorrow, for instance, I'll be in Tacoma at the First Emmanuel Church, Emmanuel Presbyterian. Then on Saturday I'll be in Cedro Woolley, and there I will be doing a workshop. And it says in the calendar that I will be doing workshops. So most of the workshops I do are free, and a lot of them are in libraries. And so it just I've done. I did in the fall. I did one in Renton, one in Tequila. Um, so, so yeah, I, I do workshops. Um, usually that's, that's a way of maximizing time in a place too, you know, to do a workshop and then do a, do a, do a reading. Mm -hmm. yeah. Perfect. Yes. You. Yeah, so can you tell us a little bit about your vision for your future work? For my future work? Oh my god. Especially in these hostile <laughs> times. Especially <laughs> in these hostile times. Yeah. Working with Immigrant community. Yeah. Um, well, you know, that's a really good question. So I found myself writing more journalistic work. Um, I wrote an op-ed to the Seattle Times about uh, the kids when the kids were separated at the border. And I wrote a piece for Yes Magazine, also related to, to the immigrant crisis. So I'm finding myself more writing nonfiction, more journalistic nonfiction in a way. Um, I think part of, when I was, when I considered submitting an application and subsequently when I was offered the position of Poet Laureate, I thought very hard about accepting 
accepting the the honor, really, and the work. Um, and then in the end, what I decided was that that we have, we as a collective society, we have sometimes very fixed ideas of who people are. So we have fixed ideas about who immigrants are. And the narrative that we're getting is one always of kind of associated with negative images. I just read a professor at UCI, Hector Tovar, who was an early uh, Seattle, not Seattle Times, Los Angeles Times journalist, writing about the portrayal of Latinos as, as cartel members on Netflix and these things. And he's saying, you know, this <coughs> constant depiction of Latinos in these violent roles who endorses this idea that, that <coughs> Latinos are violent people. I mean, and so he's, he's, this is a larger question, of course, but I thought about the possibility that I had then as an ambassador to literature and letters and, and beauty as, a, as an immigrant woman and as a woman of color. And I thought both of the opportunities to inspire young people, because frankly, I would have become a writer a long time ago had I had people who would have inspired me and mentors who looked like me. And I think it took me a long time. I was a grown person by the time I understood that this is something I needed to do. But by then, I sort of could coach myself. You know, I think I would have done it earlier. And so I thought that this was a chance, perhaps, for me to inspire kids, immigrant kids, to, to, to think of themselves as writers and to think that, hey, you could do this thing. You could look at this woman. She's doing this. And so part of it was this opportunity to do that. And also the other side of that was an opportunity to dismantle conceptions about who immigrants are, right? Because we, we think, you know, immigrants do, well, a terrible things sometimes, or, you know, this criminality issue, or things that are um, manual labor, right? And we degrade manual labor, which is also an issue, because work is work, and work is honorable. But we degrade that, and so, and especially in the arts, there is very few people like me, right, in the arts. So I thought this is a chance both to inspire and to dismantle stereotypes of people. And so I think of myself of doing a little bit of that work just by the work, just by being who I am, um, and then writing pieces about El Salvador. You know, I was I was in um, I was in Mineral, which is a town of two hundred people. I did a reading, and people drove far away at the, at the, at this, it was public reading. And this woman came back the next day, and she said, you know, I remember El Salvador. This is a very white, rural white community. She said, I remember El Salvador in the news in the 1980s. I kind of had forgotten, but last night when you read those poems, I went back and I looked it up, and I'm trying to learn about what's going on there. And I thought, you know, if that's what my words and my poems did for her, then that is a really good thing. So I think those kind of moments of connection and inspiration are sort of what I see myself doing in this, in this time uh, that we have, you know, mostly through writing. For a long time I didn't write because I couldn't understand how could writing actually uh, do social justice work. And this is why I became an urban planner when I was a young person, I went to a planning school, I became a planner. Um, and because I thought I could work towards issues of equity and justice through that. Um, and then it's turned out to be that I, I, because I couldn't see it as a writer, and it's turned out that that is what I'm doing, mm -hmm. just by the mere topics that I'm choosing to, to write about, and that I tend to write about. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank yeah. you. Yeah. The box of books your father insisted you bring sounds fascinating. Can you talk a little bit more about why he did that and what kind of what your parents brought with them? That um, yeah, I mean that is a put you on this path. Yeah, that's uh, so we left in the war. You know, it was a, it was a terrible time in El Salvador, <coughs> and there's lots of documented about that. And I actually think all of those immigrants coming out of El Salvador, that is the aftermath of the war. You know, mm -hmm. Europe and Germany didn't rebuild in 10 years. They got a ton of money from us, the US, and years of lots of injections of money to rebuild. El Salvador never had that. And so mm -hmm. what we're seeing with that is that 
migration is the result of the civil war. So for me, those two things are attached, but we left at the heart of it. And my parents were teachers. And um, my father in particular, both my parents were big readers, but my dad was a scholar. And it was interesting, the books that he brought, he, we brought, he had, I still have them. I mean, that's what the story is there in my bookshelf here. Um, they're mathematics books, and books about language, and books about history of El Salvador, and just the gram grammar books about Spanish grammar books. And I don't know that he was even that conscious about why he was choosing that, but somewhere, you know, you look back and you think, yeah, he wanted us to remember our language, right? So therefore the grammar books, and this was something valuable, it was a profound lesson for me in what books could do, that we came with teeny little, we came escaping a war, and yet we were driving this box of books. And so that, um, there's a local, Margaret Can is a local writer. She does not live in West Seattle, but she lives in Seattle. <laughs> and um, she wrote this book called Women Writing About Home. And a lot of the, uh, it's an anthology, it's in the library, it's a really wonderful book, and a lot of the stories are written by local, by uh, people, I think Claudia Rowe also has a story there. And I, my story in that book has to do with that, uh, with the story of the, of the books um, that my family brought and how for a long time I thought they were a curse because I kind of became the caretaker of this box of books that nobody wanted. <laughs> and they're useless, they're expired, the information has changed, you know, and yet here I am. And then one time, until I came to understand uh, sort of, you know, the books really are a uh, representation of our, of our plight and what it, of a life that we had there. You know, we, if it had not been for the war, we would have this life with a garden like that, you know, with books and music, which is what we had before we left. So it's kind of a reminder of an alternate existence that was lost because we needed to, to we, we escape. We were lucky to have left when we did. How yeah. old were you when you left? 14. 14. Yeah. You said that. Yes. Um, you mentioned Mineral Washington twice, and I just looked it up. How, yes. how is it that you, or does someone else, choose where you go? No, I choose where I go. So the, we, we each choose our, where we go. And I get lots of invitations and lots of email to sort through, and I frankly try to honor everybody. The, my calendar is really packed. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the people at Mineral, well, there's an extraordinary thing at Mineral is that somebody from West Seattle, who's a writer actually, <laughs> Jane Hodges, uh, um, bought this school, Mineral School, because Mineral shrunk to this teeny town where the school, there's no kids there anymore. Not enough kids to merit a school. And so she's transformed this as a writer's retreat. And she offered to me that I could go and stay at this school. And you stay in the class. The classrooms are intact. They are like the day the teacher walked out of there. And, but she, there's beds and everything, you know. And so, um, so you stay. So she offered for me free of charge to stay at the school, and I could travel to these locations. And so, that was very handy for me. I, I mean, it was a, quite impacted. It's very beautiful there. And it's a part, I mean, I just go to places that I never thought of I would go. And um, I love my time there. I think that's why I mention it so much. It made a huge impact on me. But people will offer me a place to stay, like in Twisp, some hotel. A person is uh, on the board of the Arts Council in the Metal Valley. And they said, you could stay at our hotel for free. And so I had a base, and then I could go to all these schools. So normally I try to go for like a week. It's easier for my family here, and so I um, so I choose I choose what I where I go, and yeah. I'm trying to cover all the whole state. But, but it's very hard because there's so many conflicts. You know, it's very hard to pull off. Yeah. Yes. When I was in college, I had some friends that also escaped from El Salvador, and they were also in education. Oh, well, their parents. Yes. So, where did you go to school? Uh, this was University of Colorado. In oh, okay. Boulder. Yeah. Um, so, that's interesting to hear that, you know, you had this experience too, but you may have addressed this earlier. I apologize I was late, but um, who were or did you have some 
poets or other writers that you feel influenced you in some way uh, when you were either in school or since? Or yeah, I, I, mean, I think for me, a central figure for me is Pablo Neruda. Yeah. Uh, because I read a lot, I mean, I read in Spanish, of course. Yes. So I think for me, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, he's not a poet, but he had a huge influence on me in understanding, I remember when I read 100 Years of Solitude for the first time, for the first time, A, I was, I thought, this isn't magic realism, this is the way people live in the Messiah <laughs> where I'm from, you know, this is how people, this magical thinking, that is like really how people think, I mean, it's yeah. extraordinary, yeah. that little baby, people think that baby is alive, you know, yeah. and people believe that because, mm -hmm. And actually, after I saw that baby, I thought I could see how they believe it. <laughs> but I mean, uh, and, and also just thinking about the way in which he writes about Colombia, which, you know, Spain did a very good job with, with during the colonial colonial times because I have been in towns in Colombia, the remote towns where I swear it looks exactly like at the Gisaya where I am from. Mm -hmm. The same layout of the towns, the same structure, the same, it's like a cookie cutter design. So you know empire was there just by that imprint on the terrain that they left. Um, and so just thinking about it, he's writing about Colombia, but it felt like he was writing about my town in El Salvador. And for the first time I, I saw myself reflected in, in literature and, and saw that my experience is worth writing about, that my experience as a Latina, as a Salvadoran, is beautiful, and that there's something worth talking about there. So I think that was seminal for me, and, and the Ruta as well, in the way in which you know, he writes. And then there's, of course, people like Lucille Clifton. I go back to Lucille Clifton all the time. I, I love her writing. And, um, Marie Ponceau, who's another American writer. She's a, does anybody know Marie Ponceau? She's a, is in, East, in the East Coast. She had seven kids and wrote, writes this amazing poetry. The library has her books. So, Ponceau is a French name, uh, P-O-N-S-O-T. Marie Ponceau, yeah. Uh, so I go back to Basho a lot, the Japanese writer. Um, I go back to Chinese writers as well, ancient, you know, Li Po, uh, I love their writing. So, I think those are anchors for me, yeah. Lucille and Shakespeare Lucille. as well, Clifton. and Shakespeare, Lucille, Lucille Clifton. 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 Yeah, Clifton. yeah, I want to show you this picture, I didn't read the, um, that is where I grew up. Oh, wow. That is about a block from my father's house. And that's the volcano that you see there. <laughs> that is Guatemala. The volcano is in Guatemala. And that's this little town where my father, where I was in December and where I grew up and where, like I said, my great-grandmother and my grandparents are. Um, yeah. But you said you have a poem. I do have a poem. I could read it for you and I could yes. close with that. Yes. Does it say the poem Cementerio? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I could I could read you that poem, and then I think we'll call it a night because I know we have to do it. So what does cementerio mean? Cementerio means cemetery. Cemetery, awesome. Yeah, but I wanted to show you the picture because I just think it's extraordinary. And then the <laughs> evening, that thing just it becomes pink with the light, and it just feels so close to there to there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this. Uh, the story behind this is I wanted to go visit my um, my grandmother and my cousin who was killed during the war at the local cemetery there. And the, <coughs> the cemetery is in direct line to the church. So the church is on that long avenue because when the mass ends, people walk with the coffin and accompany the coffin all the way through the white gates of the cemetery into the cemetery to bury. And I saw three buried, I saw three um, what would you say? Funerals, thank you. Funeral marches uh, while I was there, unfortunately. But it, culturally very interesting to see as well. So, and I wanted to go, but the day I wanted to go was already too late, and my cousin said, we shouldn't go there because there's gangs there. 
I had no problem with gangs, but El Salvador, as you know, in television, there's a lot of gangs in El Salvador, uh, which are actually uh, a, an export from the U.S. Mm -hmm. to El Salvador. Mm -hmm. um, and so it could be very dangerous in some parts to travel because most of what they do is a lot of petty crime. I mean, I think there's some drug, but a lot of it is extortion of like the mafia, extor you know, extortionism of people. So some merchants have to pay the gangs to open up their stores so that people could go into their shops. And there's stories of teachers having to pay so that they could go in and teach at their schools where they are, or even passing a particular street. Somebody will plant themselves and say, you have to give me a dollar um, just to cross the street, because that's the way we've decided. And so this is real, and it's really crippled El Salvador. And so this story tells a little bit about that. And my family, I couldn't go, because I chose to go too late. I didn't have that many days, and they said it's not safe. There's, there's gangs around that area, so we better not go. So that's what this is about. Cementerio. They say gang members guard the entrance to the cemetery Maraud about, waiting to pounce, do the things they do. Gangs are at the gate now, but the dead, the birds, the trees were there first. Let them come in through the white gates and keep coming, the birds. Let their trilling, their feather warblings spill onto the dead. Let Luis, my cousin killed six days after he turned 23, let him rejoice in the chirping and the cooling shadows of the trees that sway above his humble grave. Let Gladys, who is buried without a marker because the war wasted her, washed her from everything, even her name, and is listed instead as addendum to her mother's cross. Here lies Elvira Magaña y Gladys. Let those who went venerably into eternal slumber, like my abuela, my great uncles, my great grandmother, my great grandfather, who all died as people should, from the rasping of time against lung, let them enjoy this avian gift. Let all the Castros and the Levas, the Sanchezes and the Quijadas, the dead tucked inside white mausoleums with black porticos, and those whose stiff bones rest under dirt mounds, let them all read bird song. Let them rest in peace, the way things were before, before dollars and coyotes, gangs, migra, guerra, remesas, before caravans and walls, the time before these words orbited into the constellation of our Salvadoran speech. Where can we find that? <laughs> I'm still, I was editing that before I came. <laughs> so it's still a work in progress. Um, but I, I'm hoping to get some of those poems published locally, yeah, published here in the state, yeah. Yeah, but it's, you know, all those words didn't exist when I was there. All those worries of, I mean, even the Salvadoran coin is now the dollar. So we are so linked, and this is what I say in those pieces that I wrote, uh, journalist pieces that we are not an isolated organism as a country. We are linked uh, to other people. And El Salvador is one of those places where we went and did a lot of damage with policies in the 80s, where billions of milli millions of dollars were sent down there. And I truly believe if the US hadn't gotten so involved providing weapons to the government with all that terrible repression, many people would have never come, including my own family. You know, we were fine there. And so, uh, so I think we, we can't obliterate history from what is happening. And that is my sadness with what's happening, that there's this amnesia around historical facts. And um, so, you, you know, you ask me what, what I'm doing, and this is, what, this is what I'm doing, you know? It's timely. Um, yeah. So I think, oh, the last thing I have is, I have these bookmarks, which are, you please take one, there's a poem in the back, they're a gift of Humanities Washington, and I also have this book to give away, I want to give you this book, which is Todd Marshall's um, book, Washington, his, it's a beautiful book, it is a beautiful book. So I normally ask a question, like a trivia question, <laughs> about Washington State, so I'll ask, um, what is 
the if if you could think of, of our state map, what is the uh, the town that sits in the southeastern corner of our state? Asotin Tri City. Oh, who said Asotin? <laughs> Snake River. It's down in the Blue Mountains. Um, I've hiked a lot there. Oh, have you? And they have a wonderful old-fashioned, very old-fashioned history museum there uh -huh. with portraits and machinery, farm machinery and so forth. But it's near the, um, the canyon, you know, Hell's Canyon mm -hmm. area, which mm -hmm. is a beautiful area. Yeah, yeah, it is really beautiful there. It is truly beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was there uh, at the library and uh, did a reading, it was lovely. And then the next, two days later, I was in um, Friday Harbor. Oh, oh God. God. <laughs> oh. And I thought, this the is really down. crazy. <laughs> I just oh, went across, yeah. The, yeah, it was, it, yes. Yeah. It was Ness Pierce country at one point. Chief Moses uh, had a, or Chief Joseph, I'm sorry. Chief Joseph, a, yeah. Yeah, had horses up into the mountains there. Uh -huh. um, yeah, it is truly yeah. very yeah. different than here. You know, very different than Western Washington geographically. The absence of trees was really interesting there, and uh, just the play of shadows of the clouds on the on the hills was really extraordinary. It was almost like an ocean, watching the ocean, but from the sky as the shadows played on the, you know, on the on the barren hills. Yeah. Good. Very few people know that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Please take uh, take a post. Uh, a bookmark and the books This City and Killing Marias are part of our library system and check out the Seattle Poetic Grid which is an online project you could go and click on all those forms it's super fun to click around yeah thank you so much for coming